slides down details you know okay oops no I need I need my glasses can you switch on the slide <laughs> now it's very tiny to read what I'm Ah, here, I can do it here. Okay, slide show. <laughs> Sorry. I hope it will. Okay, so I, I simply want to give you a little bit the viewpoint of a material scientist, how to find the materials, and I think recently it's totally easy to find all this material since you uh, have to go only to a web page and you click, click about materials, and then you know whether it's topological or not. Okay, so and... Uh, in this sense, I have two parts of the talk, and in between I will have a break. The first time is how to find, we find the materials, and then what we do with our simple measurements, okay? So to give you a little bit what you can measure. And the motivation, I think, for me is especially, so I, I have some background in density functional theory, and all the theoreticians normally cry if they see me, you know, people who do density functional theory are not very popular <laughs> in the theoretical community. But now with topology, we are very, quite happy for the moment with a single particle picture, so it's very trivial. And uh, what I think is really amazing is uh, many of the properties, since these are global properties, so they come from the bulk of a material. You have some really new, interesting uh, properties which can be quantized transport, but uh, I'm originally also from the community of spintronics, so because spin momentum is locked, you might even have uh, new spintronic devices. And uh, there are quite new properties, uh, like the viscous flow of electrons, so some of the electrons, and I give an example also at the end, I hope, uh, that the electrons behave different than uh, due to gas, so it's not really a single particle picture. And I think we are now ready, and you guys are hopefully, and girls are ready to, to go beyond the single particle picture. And what we aim for is like, as material scientists, we are more practical. You know, we don't, we are not happy in the millikelvin range, so we like to have room temperature effect. So, the, so I want to give you a little bit an impression how we find the materials, and I think uh, after a short introduction, and then how we measure. So. Um, as I said, topology is a global property, and this is a school where everybody knows what topology means, that we uh, simply look for the topology in the electronic structure, and uh, the genius is different for football and German rolls compared to donuts and a coffee pot. And uh, for, for even in other fields, topology plays an important role, and I tell you this because I'm also interested to making a bridge between topological materials and solid state physics and having impact maybe to chemistry. So because there is also a lot of topology in molecules and chemistry and there are very, very similarities, many similarities which can maybe also be an area or a direction beyond what we are doing now. So we know especially carbon and with graphene, carbon atoms play a major role also in the field of topology has uh, four ligands, and I can have the same ligands, but making two molecules which are uh, topologically distinguished because they cannot bring into, uh, they, are, they have different, also based on this chirality, they have different properties. And this is the origin of the life, or origin of life. So most of the people uh, connect topology with the origin of the universe, with matter, antimatter, and chiral anomaly, but you see there's also a strong connection, and because the DNA, uh, they have also um, um, different chirality based on the carbon atoms. So uh, another very nice uh, example in chemistry makes even a nice bridge between donuts and Möbius stripe, and it's again strongly related to graphene, is that in chemistry you count the electrons of a, uh, of a, a P, electron system, so this is uh, benzene. Benzene is the unit to build, the primary unit to build graphene, and so we have a few p electrons in graphene, which are six, so you see here, double bond there, double bond, and there, and the picture is uh, 
everybody knows wrong, because the electrons are no, not localized. This would look like we have a double bond between two carbons here, and the single bond, and the double bond, and the single bond. So there should be different bonding distance between the carbons, but this is not the case. The, bonding, the electrons are delocalized. And uh, you can even simply by predicting, uh, by counting the carbon atoms and uh, counting the or uh, the atoms and counting the p electrons, you can predict whether a system is aromatic, which means the electrons are delocalized, de or whether they are not. So here, for example, if we take the be example benzene, we have six, six carbon atoms and uh, six p electrons, and they are aromatic because they fulfill this 4n plus 2 pi electron rules. If we say n is equal 1, it's six electrons, and this is exactly what we have. Okay. So now we can con put two rings together or an infinitive number of rings together, and then we end up with graphene. And this is also why graphene is very special, because uh, these electrons are delocalized here over the whole sheet of graphene. And uh, if you strain it, if you want to make it asymmetric, it's very difficult, because then you must localize the electrons, which graphene doesn't like. Okay? So in this sense, graphene is a flat surface because of all these p electrons are delocalized, and uh, it's symbolized in this sense like a bio donut. So, but what you can do, you can also make this kind of molecules, which have a twist in real space, and then this rules whether something is aromatic, which means the electrons are delocalized or not delocalized, is different. So if I have a flat atom, uh, a flat molecule, so the rule is, as I explained to you, the p number of p electrons should be 4n plus 2 to be aromatic. And to localize the electrons, it's if we have 4n electrons, OK? But if we make a twist in the molecules, the rules inverts. So if I have a Möbius kind of uh, molecules, uh, they are aromatic with 4n electrons, and they are anti-aromatic with four and plus two electrons. And uh, this you can simply see if you do a Hücke calculation or a very simple kind of tight binding uh, calculation in the circular equation. I don't want to explain it, but I think it's maybe a direction in the future to think about uh, in the context of topology, what we are doing now at distant solid state. So you see really the, um, the resonant integral is different. And can we really make these molecules indeed? So uh, in chemistry, this is a big field to try to make this Möbius kind of anulines, which have different properties. So you make a big molecule, and you should think it doesn't matter whether the molecule is really twisted, looks more like a Möbius stripe, or whether it's a, a, a planar kind of uh, aromatic molecule like graphene, but it is. So they should two different properties, even on the first view. The atoms are all the same. The connection of the atoms are the same. The only thing is that at one place there is a, a twist. OK, so, but we, are, we want to go back to the solid state. And uh, I want to give you a little bit an impression how we identify the materials. And uh, the nice thing is because, uh, so like in physics, you, oops, oh, what is this? In physics, you like to think about the, uh, I have to be careful now what I'm doing here, uh, reciprocal space. And in chemistry, so we want to translate it into real space or material science because we want to make the, the, um, the crystals and we want to measure something. But the nice thing is, as I said, for the single particle picture, is more or less now there's a direct connection. So if somebody draw, uh, makes a picture of a band structure, or uh, you, you have a Hamiltonian, you draw a picture of an electronic structure, it's very easy to translate this into the real space. And therefore, the whole field of topology is so successful because there's a prediction in quite after a short time so if there are not too many correlated electrons involved, we can make the material and measure even. And I'm quite surprised because more or less, like what the theoretician predicts, we measure. You know, it's, it's amazing. So it's like you as a generation, you know only topology, but I know high TCs. And everybody who worked in high TCs recognized after 10 hopeless prediction of theoretician you gave up and you looked for something else, OK? 
So because there's a direct connection between the electronic structure, the crystal structure, and even if I will talk shortly about the new fermions, the band connectivity is very strongly related to the position of the atoms if I want to have an eightfold degeneration here. So I need atoms on high, uh, with a high Wyckoff position here. They must be on positions which are highly symmetric. Uh, 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 highly symmetric. Okay, so, and this is a little bit also still an introduction here, so I want to, at the end, so that you see really clearly the connection between uh, reciprocal space and real space, and maybe get this, I will not explain in detail or something, because this is the viewpoint of Andre Bernevik, how he uh, identify um, uh, the materials, and I was a part of this uh, in a certain point, so by starting with atomic orbitals using the k dot p theory, look for this uh, elementary band representation, and then via graph theory, he can identify uh, with the help of Vanya functions whether he gets a topological semi-metal, a trivial semi-metal, or uh, this disconnected EBR. So people who want to read this, there's a few hundred pages. But nowadays, there are two nice papers, and this are even better for us in material scientists. Uh, material scientists, there are one paper from one of the former postdocs of Andrew Bernevik, which is a catalog of topological materials. They are both preprints. They are both, I think, 1,000 pages. But um, the nice thing is um, now more or less from all the existing materials which are already known in the database, they are categorized by trivial and topology. So in this sense, every simple material, uh, non-magnetic, it's only valid for non-magnetic and uh, simple materials where the one, uh, the, uh, one particle approximation, the DFT works. Uh, is, uh, but this is nice because you can go now to two servers. One is the Bilbao, it's a little bit more complicated, it's like Andre things, and find out if you have a material, whether it's topological. Here it's even predictive, so if I make a new material, I can go there, because what, as I explained to you, more or less from, the, from my crystal structure and the position of my atoms, I can now conclude with a number of valence electrons without even doing a band structure calculation, whether there's a high probability that my material is uh, topological. But there's a very nice uh, web page also, and if you want, you can immediately, this you should write down, because here it's really very, very convenient. This is from the Chen paper. So you click, you, you go to this web page, you have a periodic table, and then you click, for example, I want to know whether there's a calcium tin oxide, which is topological. So I click on calcium, I click on tin, I click on oxide, oxygen, and then I get this as an answer. So, and you see, this are the compounds. Um, this are the space groups, and then this are the topological classes. So, so I see most of them are trivial insulators. There's only this inverse perovskite with a, is a topological crystal insulator. So, so I think uh, everything which is on a simple basis in the first approximation. Sometimes I think there's still, I would say, because it's DFT based, uh, not hundred uh, percent correct, but there's a way to do it. Okay, so. But how can you understand how we think and find intuitively topological insulators? This is like, a, um, you know, so, so because the world has changed now, because before we had simply normal insulators, so we have a conduct, conduction band and a valence band, and the Fermi energy which separates conducting electron and valence electron, and depending from the size of the gap, we distinguish insulators, semi-metals, semiconductors and metals. So an insulator, normally in material science you expect, is like a 4 EV band gap. So I think we will never find a topological insulator, okay? Because we will never find a material, and maybe later you understand, it's not possible to find a 4 EV band gap, I think, with a band inversion. Maybe in a crystalline insulator, but I think because the point is you have to have this overlapping band, and I explain later. So if the band gap is smaller, so like a, so we even in solar energy, we talk about semiconductors, and this are 1.6 EV band gaps or so, which is still quite large. And uh, these are yellow powders, you know, so if, 
And I still think we cannot find really here the topological insulators. This must be smaller. Like my estimation from intuition would be uh, like one EV or so. But I don't know because they're always surprised in topology. The compounds which yesterday were not topological are topological today. So we know from bismuth. Bismuth was not topological, but now it's a higher order topological insulator. So for us it's good, okay? We grow the crystals, whatever. At the end, we put them in the, and we store them and later they become topological, okay? So, uh, so semi-metals can be, uh, have a tiny overlap between the conduction band and the valence band. I will also talk about semi-metals. And if we have semiconductors which have a direct band gap where the conduction band and the valence band has maximum and the minimum, uh, maximum at the same point, so we have this kind of band structure for semi-metal, but they can be also at different point in the reciprocal space, and we have this kind of band structure for semi-metal. So what is the best topological insulator? And this was one thing. Uh, there's no insulating elements, only with very wide band gaps. So gases even, they have super wide band gap. So in the periodic table, so this was the motivation after the prediction with graphene. So therefore, it was made sense to take look for two elements. This is how we do. So, um, okay, so what is the topological insulator? We need a band inversion. And this is the picture which normally is drawn. So, like we have a normal semiconductor like silicon or uh, gallium arsenic. As I said, we have the valence band and the conduction band and the band gap. And what can also happen, as I said, we can have semi uh, metals where we have an overlap between the conduction and the valence band. And then we get this crossing points here in the band structure. And depending from the symmetry of the bands, we can have here a forbidden crossing, which means the crossing is not allowed, and we open up a band gap. And uh, so um, we don't, uh, so if we have this crossing point, and if we have, uh, sorry sometimes makes what it wants. So if you have this crossing point and we have heavy elements, so spin orbit coupling can help to open up this crossing here because the spin is not a good quantum number and we get the band structure which we see as the band structure for a topological insulator where we have a part of the valence band and here a part of the uh, conduction band in the same band and this is symbolized uh, by the uh, Möbius stripe, uh, while this is symbolized by a uh, donut. So, um, but there are different reasons to open up a band gap here. It has not always been spin orbit coupling, but if you have crossing points, spin orbit coupling helps you to open up band gaps. Okay, so after the prediction from Kane and Mailer that graphene should be a topological insulator. And you know, graphene is here in the top of the periodic table. This is my periodic table, which guides you also through my talk. So, um, and the numbers here is, the numbers are the electronegativity here beyond the atoms. And they help you to understand whether materials are very ionic. Because if you, so this is nitrogen, uh, uh, the numbers tells you how, how much the atoms like to have the electrons, so we know fluorine likes mostly the electrons, while the atoms on this side, they don't like the electrons, and so therefore we have ionic compound if we combine, for example, sodium with chlorine, we have sodium chloride, it's a white powder, white, white, white band gap. So uh, this uh, doesn't help for topological insulators. So uh, therefore this is uh, a little bit of help, this numbers. And uh, here we know that the spin orbit coupling increases if we go to heavier element compounds. So it was clear when the prediction was done for graphene. Even graphene is a very special compound with a very nice band structure and there's crossing points, there's Dirac points. So the spin orbit coupling is very small because it's just on top of the, in the top area of the periodic table. So, but if you go to the bottom where you have more spin orbit coupling, so we know all the rare earths and actinides are metals, so they're not insulators or semiconductors. And uh, so, so people thought there's no topological insulators in the element at this time, and everybody was therefore looking for two elements, which was good for me as a material scientist, because then people are interested in getting some advice. 
Um, anyway, nowadays we know if we can make one layer of tin or one layer of bismuth, and bismuth itself is also higher order topological insulator, so with time we have even more higher, more complex topological properties, and uh, so it's not hopeless uh, if you have here, like, uh, if you have um, made the crystals. Okay, so then this was uh, what then Shoshan did, and Andrew Bernovic, they looked for two elements, and two elements, semiconductors, are used in uh, electronics and in solar cells. And as I said, in solar cells, you have uh, a band gap around two. So the materials you are looking for is cadmium selenide and cadmium telluride. But this was too big. Uh, the heavy element compounds have very often very small band gaps and even negative band gaps. And this was why Shoshan predicted mercury telluride because this, you see, is a small band gap, even a negative band gap. And the people in solar cells and electronics, they like to draw this like the energy gap versus the lattice constant, because they like to make devices. So if you have compounds with the same lattice constant, you can make a nice devices because you can grow them on top of each other without having strain. So uh, this was the prediction. And then soon after this, there was a realization, and Shushan even uh, told me the story. So when they looked into mercury telluride compared to cadmium telluride, here you see cadmium telluride. This is your way to draw the band structure. This is my way to draw the band structure, you know. You have a conduction band which has S character, and we know above the Fermi energy all the bands are anti-bonding, while below they are bonding or non-bonding, you know. So and here is our Fermi energy, and this is a sigma type B bonding, so it looks like this. So this has, uh, uh, so this changed the phase here and this changed the phase here. Anyway, so in mercury telluride, indeed, this S electron band comes below the Fermi energy. Uh, at the beginning, some papers thought it's related to spin orbit coupling, but this is not the case. It's a relativistic effect. If you go to heavy element compounds, every heavy element has uh, the so-called 6s electrons or even 5s electrons contracted due to the relativistic effect. So 1s electrons are so close to the uh, core, so they are contracted, and therefore there is a tendency that the s electrons always come below the uh, p and other conduction electrons. So this is uh, already in the atomic limit. So and uh, I think the the, the, the bonding or the heaviness of mercury telluride makes really uh, that, the, that the, there's an overlap between the conduction and the valence band. Anyway, so the problem is that here we have an S electron which is only uh, not degenerated, and the P electrons, even in the relativistic case, are degenerated. So, which means if we change the position, we end up with the semi metal and it's not a topological insulator. It's far away from being topological insulating. So, Shoshan told me, so he was quite frustrated when he saw this band structure, but then he got a German thesis of a PhD student, and he, since he was in Germany as an undergraduate, he could read it. And then he recognized if he makes a quantum wave structure between cadmium telluride and mercury telluride, he can get more or less best of both worlds. By making a certain thickness of the mercury telluride, he can have the band inversion and still a band gap. But the band gap is then very small because he started from a zero band gap. And uh, in a quantum well, uh, you cannot get a 0.3 EV band gap, which means you have to measure properties at very low temperature, like here at 0.3 uh, uh, Kelvin. And uh, Lorenz Molenkamp, at this time when uh, Shoshan visited him, he already had the samples in stock. So this was why the prediction was only one year before the experimental realization, where they found this quantum spin hall effect in this quantum well. Another way is if you already know bismuth is not so bad, but it's the same metal, it's also not an insulator. You can think about what can you do with bismuth. Uh, alloy bismuth, for example, sorry, this is German. It, I took it from German, <laughs> sorry. So then you can think about alloying or making a two uh, another bismuth compound with a second element. 
uh, to make bismuth a topological insulator, and this is the case for bismuth selenide and bismuth uh, telluride and antimon telluride and so on, the series of these compounds, where you can make this very nice uh, quintuple layered compound. It's even a 2D, quasi 2D material, but it, this is a super big single crystal made by Bob Kava, so which you see, so it's also another way. Here we really have the, I don't have the picture here, but I'm sure you have seen this. So here you have really theoretically an insulator with a 300 milliV band gap, which should be a topological insulator at room temperature. So then later people predicted many compounds. So we tried to make a, it in a certain order. This is 2014 nowadays, it's as you have heard, so you go simply to the web page, click, 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 and you will find like thousands of topological insulators. So you, it's still not, the optimal compound is not found yet, but you know they all have in common from the viewpoint, if you are a material scientist, uh, they have in common the so-called, what I call in that pair effect, that the six S electrons are contracted, and they are made by atoms like bismuth, like is this compound which has, if you count the electrons, three plus, while bismuth is in row five, where you expect five plus. But this already gives you a hint that the six S electrons are not really giving away because of the relativistic effect. They are now closer to the core, so they are stabilized close to the core. And you can still have a gap with a six S2 configuration without giving the S electrons away. So therefore, all this heavy element like bismuth, tin, and lead, and thallium in this area, they all have a by two reduced valence state if they are topological insulators. So this is what you can call in chemistry in a perfect, but it's like a relativistic effect in physics. So then if you look for example, so one condition as I said is now that we have the band inversion and the second condition you can only look for a central symmetric compounds, if I didn't choose the mercury telluride here, is that you look whether you have the parity change in the eigenvalues Otherwise, you do what is easier for you, but not for me, because there's a two classification to identify topological insulators. So for me, as I said, the S electrons come down. Here I compare copper selenide with uh, silver telluride. So again, light elements versus heavy elements, and the same band structure as the mercury telluride, but here, because it's central symmetric, I'm allowed to draw the picture. So I have an anti-bonding S electron here and bonding P electron here, but they are sigma type, they are bonding directly, so I can determine the parity. This is negative and this is minus. And then if I change the symmetry, so if this S electron pair, uh, this S orbitals come below the Fermi energy and the kappa and the selenium, so they change the sign. As you see, they become bonding and they change the parity, and this is what we need as a second condition for uh, the topological insulator. So it's very easy. So what is important, as I said, now I want to explain a little bit more in a very, very fast way, what do we need as ingredients? One is the crystal structure. If we want to understand topology, we need to understand the crystal structure of this material, and the crystal structure is made by the lattice and the atoms, and our atoms are now fishes. And the crystal structure, the symmetry, the, the lattice points, can, the atoms can sit on lattice points, but they don't have to. So they can also sit on different points, but this lattice points and the degeneration and the symmetry of the local symmetry of the lattice points are very important if you later look for uh, new fermions because then they have to be very high symmetric. And uh, if you look for chiral fermions, it's also very, so, so therefore it's very important. Oops. So uh, then we can, if we have a lattice, so then we can build up a unit cell. I don't, I think this you all know. So the unit cell has to be described in ABC and three angles. This gives us uh, the smallest repeated unit. So we have to make a lattice, which you see here, from a unit cell, which can be, if you repeat it, so uh, build up in this, uh, uh, the whole crystal structure. So you see this is the unit cell and you can distinguish what is the smallest unit cell easily. Okay, so, 
And then uh, you need, despite of the ABC and the angles of your lattice, you need here the example graphene because this is also an important compound for topology. So we can have two kinds of unit cell here. This is simply the difference here between these two unit cells is simply the origin. So if I set the origin here in an atom, this is my unit cell. If I set the origin in the middle of my hexagon, this is the unit cell. And both are equivalent, it's the, but then if I set the unit cell different, the atomic positions are different, so which describe, and as I said, uh, these are also important if you want to describe uh, uh, the topological properties. So, it, but as I said, the atoms can be, uh, it doesn't matter if you shift the origin, so the result is exactly the same. Then you can uh, do this for all the possibilities. You end up with seven crystal uh, classes and 14 Bravé lattice, how we call this, and then if we um, even put atoms here, we end up with 230 space groups, which uh, for all the compounds, you find this in this database, the ICSD database. And this was also the database which uh, Andre Bernevik's team and the other team and also Ashwin uses if they want to identify all topological materials. And they also contain magnetic materials and highly correlated material, so it's maybe also useful for the future. So uh, more or less, if you know this, you already know a lot, and this is a slide uh, from Maya and Andre. You see what they need to do uh, their, their general principle in, uh, based on some uh, things which already Zack did in 1982. So this paper in Nature was based on some work of Zack. So if they have all the ingredients, if you know the 200 30 space groups, and if you know the atomic positions. And everything of this is in this database, in this ICSDN database, okay? So this is the way. However, so um, we have a little bit also a different approach. So we try really to make this connection directly by thinking if you want to have a certain electronic structure, how intuitively should be the crystal structure look like? Where should be the position of the atoms? And the inner pair effect, we already know, we have to go simply to heavy element compounds. So um, as I told you, so um, we have a crystal. How, why, what is, if I have two atoms from my periodic table, for example, how can I even predict how the crystal structure looks like? So I even don't need the database. So one easy assumption, and which is more or less valid in 70% of the cases, sorry, is uh, that, uh, as I said, in the periodic table, the fluorine and the oxygen have these high numbers. They like to take the electrons, while the, the alkali earth atoms and the alkaline atoms, they have very low numbers, they don't like the atoms. So they give uh, electrons. So they give the electrons normally to the atoms sitting here on the left side of the periodic table. So which means if I take, as an atom, if I take the electrons, I become bigger. Because of Coulomb repulsion, if I give my electrons away, I become smaller. So the crystal structure very, is determined by the negative charged atoms, the anion, and they all like to be uh, treated like uh, oranges. They build a close-packed uh, lattice. So if you see a staple of origin on the market, it looks like this. And you can imagine in the crystal structure, I like to have a staple of oranges uh, of the anions. For example, in oxide, this is the oxygen 2 minus. Or in fluoride, this is the fluorine 1 minus. Okay. And there's, in the metals, it's simply that the metals are not charged. So metals in the periodic table, like also most of the metals are stapled in this way. So they are close packed. But there are two ways to staple oranges. So you can staple them like here on the picture, it's A, B, C, because the third staple looks different from the first staple. But this is not always necessary because this staple, the third layer of orange, doesn't know what has happened in the first layer because they are totally deconnected, okay? So there are two possibilities to staple the third layer. So, and these are the two close packed units which we have in all compounds and all metals, and they are energetically the same. 
So it's not always clear for us to, to say what is the difference why are some of them doing the ABA stapling and a hexagonal play, close pack or why they are doing the ABC stacking and the cubic uh, 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 close pack. And the packing goes in cubic along the 111 direction while it's in hexagonal along the uh, 100 direction. So then if you close, you think you have packed your oranges closely, but they're still voids because the cations, the atoms which gave the electrons away, like sodium plus or so, they're much smaller than the anions, and then I can put the cations into the voids or the holes here. So, and there are two ways to have holes, and one is simply, you know, if, if I see a layer of uh, close packed uh, atoms, it looks like a beautiful flower. So you have one atom, the second, the third, then the next goes into So this is one, this is a one layer. So if we simply take three of them, so the next atom for sure on the next layer falls on top. And now you have a void here, which is a tetrahedral. Okay? So but there's a second possibility which is even building a bigger void, is the so-called octahedral hole, if you have an arrangement of my atoms like this. Okay? And then in the middle, we have our octahedral hole. So uh, depending on the size of my cations, they, the smaller goes in the tetrahedral side, and the bigger goes into the octahedral side. And you can even do a simple geometric uh, calculation to see this. And this is what, then you already understand many, many crystal structures, which you maybe know. Because if you have a close, cubic closed packed lattice, along the 111 direction, if you fill all the tetrahedral voids, you end up with calcium fluoride structure. If you fill half of the tetrahedral sites, you have mercury telluride, so which is also filled like a tetrahedral. So, and if I fill all the octahedral sites, we have the sodium chloride lattice. And if we fill all, fill all the tetrahedral and all the octahedral sites, we have so-called lithium-3 bismuth. Okay, so, and you see always, uh, in most cases, uh, the, uh, the cations are in the voids. Okay, but it even explains more complex structures because the sodium chloride filling the big octahedral voids, like in sodium chloride, you can put also dumbbells, like sulfide dumbbells in there, or oxygen dumbbells, or you can even have a closed packed filling from cesium-60, so cesium-60 is uh, quite round. So the cesium-60 builds a closed packed the oranges and in the voids you find the potassium. Okay, so then you can already explain nearly most of the structures which you maybe meet in your life is like by simply having a hexagonal closed packing and a cubic closed packing and filling here the all octahedral site, it's the so-called nickel arsenate structure or the sodium chloride, the rock salt structure. Here's mercury telluride, the zinc blender. There is also a hexagonal version of the zinc blender. And, uh, but in hexagonal, we cannot fill all the tetrahedral side because they come too close to each other. So the filling uh, is more difficult. Therefore, we know also I have the feeling more cubic structures. Okay. So this is like simply the zinc blender and the wood side is again only a different stacking of the tetrahedral. Okay, so but uh, simply here to show you all hexagonal, uh, all tetrahedral sites cannot be filled in the hexagonal lattice because different, here are all the tetrahedral sites filled in the ABC cubic lattice and you see they don't have trouble. But here you see automatically if you would do this in the hexagonal, it's not possible. Anyway, so. Good, so then we can think, uh, can we, so as I said, when it was clear we don't find a topological insulator in an element, so one thought about two elements and uh, end up with mercury telluride, so, but if you have two elements, you can do, take also three elements and you have even more fun, okay? So by, for example, filling here, not only the tetrahedral side, you can have tetrahedral side, you can fill 
or the octahedral side plus half of the tetrahedral side. And this is the so-called half Oisler structure, which is also interesting in many regards for topological properties. And you see, we, if you come now back, why do we can, why can we go from diamond or silicon, which is a diamond lattice, to zinc blender, so we simply can go uh, and count electrons, and it's a semiconductor because it's a closed uh, filled chain. So here we have simply the density of states, and if we fill all the electrons in a certain band, we know, uh, and the Fermi energy is in the band gap, we have a semiconductor. So, um, so silicon is a 4 4 semiconductor because here, even in silicon, the silicon atoms are not on the same positions. They are like in zinc blender, you can say silicon, silicon. So we have a 4 4 semiconductor, and in zinc blender and mercury telluride, we have a 2 6 semiconductor, which means we have in total 8 electrons, and this filling up the S and the P bands. Because we have 2 electrons in an S band, and six electrons in three p-bands, so we have a closed shell situation. So we can now think also we can make this eight, fill this eight electrons bands with three atoms by having a, a first row element, a second row element, and a fifth row element, a one, two, five semiconductor, so this is also looks exactly the same. But uh, it's even better for if you go to three elements, you maybe can even take the D electrons into account and many people who want to work on correlated materials or magnetic materials like D electrons, okay? So then, despite of the one, two, five equal eight electrons, we have now two, uh, 10 additional D electrons, five bands. We can make an 18 valence electron semiconductor, so this looks like this. So we have now the additional D states here. They are still localized and they are not magnetic in some of the Soisler. But then we have 18 valence electrons here. One, the so-called sp3 states, in silic like in silicon plus the D electrons. So we can make semiconductors which are much more complicated now, like zirconium, nickel, tin. So which has eight ele 18 electrons. Now you can imagine to distribute 18 electrons on three atoms is even gives you more possibility. And then we know we have also the F electrons, and they are really strongly localized and therefore are very correlated. So normally we ignore the F electrons because they are so localized that they don't contribute to the valence band. So if there are even additional rare earth compounds in this ternary semiconductor, the F electrons contribute maybe to the magnetism on the side, but they don't contribute to the valence electrons and rare earths normally have three valence electrons and the F electrons. So now you can imagine that we can even play much more uh, with many more compounds than in mercury telluride. And uh, now you understand that we simply can go from two element semiconductors to three element semiconductors by simply counting to eight or 18 valence electron and realizing the same band structure like mercury telluride, a trivial uh, top, uh, trivial uh, semiconductors versus in mercury telluride uh, in, with a band inversion. We simply have to rename it like scandium nickel antimony. It has a real band gap or lanthanum platinum bismuth, which has this negative band gap. Negative band gap is here because the S electron is below like mercury telluride. So why should we do this? Why is this interesting? This is exactly because we have F electrons here, which might give us condo, topological insulators or uh, magnetic topological insulators or even here all the non-magnetic materials which have a band inversion, this is accidentally, are superconductors. And these are non-central symmetric superconductors with a very low charge carrier concentration. So they are all superconductors, but they are not superconductors. So this is the question. Is this really interesting for topological superconductors? Some people are working on this because they think they are topological superconductors. For me, it's too low. One Kelvin is too low, so because we like room temperature effect. Okay, anyway, you can make this nice thing in crystals in this compound. And as I said, also the terbium compound is a Fermi, heavy fermion with the highest gamma value. Nobody looked for uh, the the 
the game between the topological insulator band inversion and maybe the reason why Ethereum has the highest gamma value as a super heavy fermion is maybe related to topology. Ethereum has a very strange Fermi surface, so we had no time to study this so far. There's for sure something interesting and so on. So some of them, people read the papers on gadolinium platinum bismuth, which is a in a magnetic field induced wild semi-metals. This is the best wild semi-metal we have, I think. It shows all the properties predicted by theory. Also, the gravitational anomalies, this paper will be written up soon. So, so there is a nice way to play. So as I said, depending from the position in the periodic table, the, LA, the anion like more the electrons. Uh, so if they are heavy, like nitrogen, uh, is more on this side, they are more ionic. Here, therefore, I draw, have drawn or calculated by DFT simply the charge density because I think it's also a nice picture. So if you have silicon, the highest charge density is exactly between the silicon atoms because the silicon, two silicon atoms on these two different sides are exactly the same. So if you make this quite a ternary compound with aluminum and silicon, sorry, not me. So you see already, so the electron density goes more here to the silicon compared to the aluminum. And if you have nitrogen here, you see it looks like an ion and the density of is much closer to the nitrogen. So this is also very interesting, but you see also if you make a D electron system, I told you with 18 valence electrons, which looks more like a like uh, three metals together give a semiconductor, it looks still like a more ionic compound even in this complex structure. So because you simply, and you still have a gap because in this, in this tetrahedral structure you have very strong bonding, sorry, bonding, okay. So the future is in 2D material. How can we do 2D material? You can say you are talking about boring 3D material, who cares, okay. We want to have 2D material. It's not so, e it's so difficult. So because in 2D materials, very often, 2D materials have layered structure. And we can come from the 3D material to 2D material by removing one layer. We remove one cut ion layer, then we have a van der Waals gap between the unionic layer. How can this happen? So this happened not in oxides and fluorides because they are very tiny, uh, so they are very on the top here. So if they, they like very much the electrons, as you see the values are very high, nitrogen, oxygen, fluoride, and you saw already they like to be very ionic, okay? So uh, we cannot polarize them, they, they are very round. But if you go lower in the periodic table, so the values become smaller, and if you go in this direction, the value also becomes smaller, but especially here, so then in iodide and sulfide and selenide and telluride, for example, they are the, the, the atoms, even the anions are much larger and you can easily polarize this, which means I can remove one layer of cations to make this anisotropic bonding. I show you the example. So for example, I said if you have a hexagonal closed pack, uh, lattice filled with all the octahedral sites, nickel, so you come to the nickel arsenic structure. So, but if you remove one layer of nickel, so nickel, this would be nickel 2, arsenic 2, so if we remove one layer of nickel, we come to the cadmium diiodide structure, which is related also to the MOS2 structure and all of this. You see, so we have, we remove simply, the, here we still have the cations, here we remove the cations, and here we still have the cations, so we end up with two layers anions, and if they would be oxygen, the repulsion would be very large, because the concentration on charge on a small uh, anion is much higher than if I have a big polarizable anion, so if I have iodide, like cadmium iodide or selenide, I can remove a layer, I can have this structure, sorry, so, and therefore it's cadmium diiodide because uh, 
The iodide has a one, likes to have one electron, so cadmium likes to give two electrons away. So the ratio has to be one to two. So we cannot make nickel arsenide structure with cadmium uh, iodide. We need cadmium diiodide. So they, build, they like to build out this layered structure instead of, for example, the three-dimensional calcium fluoride structure, as you see here. We have this van der Waals gap. So this is a simple way. So then you can get this uh, MOS2 structure and MOT2 and tungsten T2 structure. And depending from the crystal field, we can have the second layer, we can have this 2H structure, which is here nicely in octahedral crystal field, and a 1T structure, and a 1T prime structure. And this small change is even, I don't know, the small changes even uh, makes a difference whether your compound is metallic, metallic and a wild semi-metal or even a normal trivial insulator. But anyway, I hope you got an impression now that you can make many of this, how to make 2D materials. And this is like, I always like to go back to my Häusler compounds. You can do it with all kinds of structure. So like, uh, so if you take this Häusler structure, you remove here one layer, so you end up with a so-called PBFCL structure, which you don't know, but in topology people know zirconium silicon uh, sulfide, which is also the same structure, and uh, you can have even the high TCs in this layered structure. So this is the way how we think about structures. Okay, so then you can have even a longer list. The first list you already saw, hexagonal closed pack, cubic closed pack filled all the voids. Now you fill the voids only partially in layers and then you get come to all this very uh, famous structural layers so which uh, also include MOT2, etc. Okay, so now after we uh, understand the crystal structure and we count electrons, we can maybe go beyond and uh, for me in chemistry, we have one hero, uh, in Roy Hoffman, who got the Nobel Prize in the 80s for organic chemistry. And I still think his, uh, what he did in organic chemistry is strongly related to the topology of uh, chemical reactions. Anyway, he did also very nice work on a very simple uh, picture which, uh, with uh, solids. So he simply, and we already discussed about benzene, so if we simply start, this is like uh, how you can, coming from a more chemical viewpoint on a linear combination of atomic orbital, how you can in, uh, come to the um, solid from simply come starting from a simple molecule with two atoms. You know, you add, as, as big as the circle becomes, we add more and more orbitals until we end up more or less with an electronic band structure. So, and uh, we always see very nicely, if you see here, the lower orbitals, but this you know all, I don't have to explain you, have no nodes, and then if you go higher, the number of nodes uh, increases. And uh, so you have here what we call in chemistry bonding orbitals and antibonding orbitals if we have the highest number of nodes. So why is this interesting? Because you simply can use this like what you would do with a Bloch, Bloch, uh, theorem, to, you can already think about how the bands looks like if I simply assume uh, a, a wave function made by atomic functions and uh, we have an E over K I N uh, block function and then we can simply say if K is zero uh, here in our band structure, all our S orbital has the same sign and is if K is P over A, we put it in the equation, it changes the sign from atom to atom, which means the lowest energy has, is at K equals zero because all the wave function, the, the chain of our hydrogen atoms have all the same sign, and if we go to P over A, the hydrogen atom. So we think here, simply I was maybe a little bit too fast, that we have this chain here of hydrogen atom which was here symbolized with this. So, which explains us already, if we have an S wave function, our bands always go uphill uh, because the K equals zero is always the lowest energy because they all 
overlap here. This says no nodes while if I have P over A and A is my lattice constant here, more or less in my chain of uh, a hydrogen atom, it goes up. So if we would have the same uh, situation only with P orbitals, but which are born, uh, sigma type, which are in the same direction lying on a chain, so we would simply have no phase shift if we have K equals zero, so which means I get this orbital scheme. And if I go to P over A, I get change the phase from atom to atom. So here you see this is more bonding than this. So this the P sigma type bonding goes always uphill. So now you can imagine if there is an overlap between S and P, this always leads to some crossing points because they simply go in two different directions. Um, Anyway, something else which is also important for topology is straightforward here. If I have now this hydrogen chain uh, going here to there, and we all know in one band we can have two electrons, but in the hydrogen chain, hydrogen has only one electron. We only have this uh, band half filled. And if we go to half filled, we immediately see at P over 2A that we have a degeneration of states here which easily can uh, be lifted, which we know as a pious, inst uh, uh, pious uh, instability. And this is why our hydrogen is a molecule and not a chain of atoms. Even if people put a lot of pressure, they still, still didn't succeed or this, to make a really nice hydrogen uh, crystal, which has equal distances. So because of the half filled band, we get this back folding of the band, which you all know, and we get the uh, demerization of the electrons. But this also tells us if we are looking for this crossing points like graphene, uh, a degenerated point like Dirac points, it's more often in the band structure than we think. And a nice, a nice thing also where we have this change in the electronic structure, a nice example which I discussed with Andre, it was a square net of uh, many, many crystal structures have a layer of square nets. And very often it's very interesting. So this, uh, if it's a half filled band in a square net, so it's not stable, it does a pirate's distortion. So because we can do a small structural distortion to lift the degeneration here and open up a band gap, which is bad for topology because uh, if you want to have Dirac and white semi metal, the structural distortion is bad. But what is very interesting, and I don't understand this, this is a question to you, the theoretician. If the atoms are heavier, this pious distortion doesn't appear. So it looks like that spin orbit coupling uh, helps us even to have more white semi metals. And uh, I always speculate that white semi metals only, maybe semi metals in general, can only appear in heavy element compound. But this is not proven. It's simply an intuition, maybe sometime when somebody proves it. Because here's, this was, was written in Andre's paper that you have this bismuth square nets, this distortion, so it doesn't happen, so which opens up big band gaps, so you stay with a very nice topological band structure. And so in all the space uh, group, 129 and 139, if you have heavy elements, you have this very nice topological materials. And one example is again the zirconium silicon sulfide, which people are working on because of nodal lines and many of the bismuth compounds. So many of the bismuth compounds in this space group or antimon compounds or tin or lead compounds are still interesting to investigate. Okay, so then uh, coming back to graphene, and then I make a break because then we are nearly through uh, the first part. Uh, is like, so graphene is not heavy, but it's still interesting because it's a very special compound in some sense for me, also topological, because the electrons cannot, uh, so you cannot have this double bond, so you cannot destroy graphene or strain graphene or do something. A pious distortion here is not possible, even if the atom is light, because everybody knows if we lift this degeneration, we get localized double bonds. And the gain we have because of the aromatic structure of graphene is so much that, that therefore graphene is very special. And I think on this carbon compounds, there might be also more and more interesting properties still to appear. Therefore, this 
this graphene has so many interesting properties like uh, uh, high mobility, high mean free pass, even uh, in very light element compounds, even with very low charge carry concentration. I don't want to tell you about the structure of graphene, but very similar, like with a simple LCO approach of Fickel, you can also easily explain that the graphene band structure exactly has to look like this with this degeneration point at the K point. But here we look for the P electrons, so the, the P electrons are perpendicular to the bonding direction, so the sigma bands give the lattice and all these electrons are totally delocalized in graphene. Anyway, you get the slides. And uh, with this, uh, I want to make a break for five minutes, so we might be meet at 10 past 10, okay? So it's enough for one cigarette and a little bit of fresh air. Thank you very much. Yeah, I stayed in the hotel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I only had to find the entrance. <laughs> it took me some time. Do you have a stick? Do you have a stick, or shall I put it in the Dropbox? Um, no stick. Uh,
So I maybe start now. Because they come then maybe. I have one extra. What? Ah, ring the bell. Why is it That's a bell. Oh, wow. <laughs> I can just see it every time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So now we can, you can now think, so one of the questions which we ask ourselves as uh, designing materials, can we make graphene simply more heavy? How can we increase the orbit coupling for graphene? And Siri very often does it, they put something on top of graphene, but our approach was something else. So since the mercury telluride have a has a diamond structure, so and graphene or graphite, they, they, what I can make this uh, three-dimensional structure with carbon, and I can make the uh, two-dimensional structure with carbon. So in a similar way, I can take combination of atoms, which gives us 18 valence electron, or eight valence electron, you remember, two, six semiconductors, and make a layered kind of structure which looks like graphene, and graphite, you know? So, so more or less, or so we can play around, and this has even some advantage why we thought mercury telluride has a big disadvantage, I told you. This is cadmium telluride, the S-band on top. In mercury telluride, we have the band inversion, the S-band comes below, but we have the degeneration at the Fermi energy, which is a semi-metal, so we don't have a topological insulator. So, but if we could break the symmetry of the crystal structure, then we could even have a topological insulator, right? So a cubic structure, we learn from the crystal structure here in cubic, we have A equal B equal C. So in a hexagonal structure, we have more degrees of freedom because we have A equal B, but C is different. So we already naturally break the symmetry if we go to a hexagonal structure. But the other way is also to go away from the cubic structure is like, for example, silver telluride, you can have a distorted cubic structure where the A is not any longer equal B. Or you can go what the people do in solar cells. They start from cadmium telluride, but nowadays everybody knows there's copper indium selenide solar cells. And in copper indium selenide, we double the unit cell of the zinc blender. So here we have C is not equal AB. So there are different ways to break the symmetry to lift the degeneration at the Fermi energy to make a real topological insulator, okay? And this is exactly what we did in the next step. We simply looked, we can break the symmetry by going to chicopyrites, like in the solar cells, or we can go break the symmetry like going from diamond to graphite to heavy graphite. And if you count here the electrons, this is one mercury antimony. Antimony is five instead of mercury selenide at six. So it's just the same number of valence electrons. The structure is different. It's a layered structure. And then if you look at the band structures, the red band is here, the S. So you see a band inversion in mercury telluride. You see a band inversion in silver telluride. In, in the distorted silver telluride, you open up a small band gap. But in the chicopyrite, the doubling of the unit cell, you open also a band gap. You see the band inversion and you open a bigger band gap. These are now real calculated band structure. And also in this potassium mercury antimony, you really see a nice band gap at the Fermi energy because it's hexagonal, and you have the S band below the Fermi energy, very similar like in the chicopyrite. So first we look on the chicopyrite. So normally we do the DFT band structure simply of the bike, and this are the DFT band structures of the bike, and we look for the band inversion. This is there in the chicopyrite as well as in the hexagonal in the graphite. 
So if we do this uh, tricoparite, sorry, this is tellurium termination, you see nicely if you calculate now slab, and this is a nice thing of the topological insulators, you simply calculate the slab again with DFT, or in one year function you see nicely the crossing, the surface state which you want to have in a topological insulator, the zero cone surface state. So if you now look for the, here for the mercury, uh, potassium mercury antimony, band structure, sorry, this is again my, so then you see here is cadmium telluride, the band structure is very similar like the light version in this crystal structure like potassium zinc phosphide. So there, there is, a, but here it's a layered structure so therefore we have at the gamma point the same band structure as at the A point because of the uh, now C direction. So, and in mercury telluride, we have a band inversion which leads also to this dip in the band structure. And in potassium mercury antimony, you see also this nice dip here in the band structure and the S electron coming below. However, when we try to calculate the surface state, we have no surface state in the trivial potassium zinc phosphide. Unfortunately, we have no surface state even in the inverted band structure. At this time, we were very disappointed. Because the reason is here we have two times the band inversion, very similar like in bismuth. So um, at this time it means, okay, if we have two times the band inversion, we end up with a trivial band structure, okay? So, but then we thought we are smart. We might have, can generate a situation where we have a band inversion at one point, at the gamma point, and no band inversion at the A point. But if you can imagine, then the band gap is very small. So there are a few compounds, which are here uh, seen in gray, which show exactly this band structure with a very tiny band structure. But then at the same time, the weak topological insulator came up thanks to Siri, thanks to you, or you maybe, I don't know, who did weak topological insulator. And we recognize that this compound doesn't have a nice surface state here on top of the main surface, but it has a surface state perpendicular to a layer, and this is a weak topological insulator. So then if you calculate the band structure, you see here the surface state and the crossing point. So you can find here trivial, uh, strong topological insulators with tiny gap because of the do double inversion at the gamma and the Z or A point, in, uh, and you can have uh, weak topological insulators. Anyway. At the same time, as sometimes later, uh, Andre recognized that this compound is even more interesting because if you really look in detail, what we saw here at the edge uh, state, at this edge, it's a, it's a, sorry, in this direction. It's a hourglass fermion, which was then published even in Nature after we, uh, had this very nice prediction, and it's indeed also proven in uh, uh, APES, Ingel Resort photo emission. Here you see along the gamma Z direction, it's really uh, interesting because this is like a, uh, this crossing point, it looks like an hourglass, and uh, this might be interesting for other properties. So this maybe has also inspired here, and you again said this was a compound I showed before, so uh, inspired work about the new fermions because these compounds have very special, and this was in this article where Andre and co-workers were looking for degeneration beyond Dirac and Y fermions, so they were looking for uh, band structures which have more than, like you saw in mercury telluride, this simple double degeneration, many more degeneration. And the interesting thing is, um, if you want to have this many degeneration for interesting surface state, you need atoms sitting on highly degenerated points, also Wyckoff position. So if an atom is sitting on a 16-fold position, you have a chance to find a uh, uh, 16 full degenerated point. But what are in common b beside of the nice physics, which you are interested, this was a commentary of, uh, of uh, Benaka about the paper, which was very nice for us. So if you could put on the universal uh, lattice, then you might have to find even very interesting uh, fermions which could morph. This is a citation from Heisenberg. Uh, protons into whatever, but I don't believe this. Anyway, it was nice, but all these crystal structures are non-somorphic here. So they are all cubic. 
So because if you want to have a high degeneration, or most of them are cubic or hexagonal, you have to go to uh, space groups which have extremely high symmetries, because otherwise, you know, from the space group, if A is not equal B, then you already lift the degeneration from the space group, what you learned before, structural distortion lift degeneration. And here we want to force, we want to have enforced degeneration on the highest level as possible. You know, so then you have to go really to look for cubic space groups and very high symmetry. So with the high numbers, 225 or something like this. Okay, so and you have to look for non-symorphic crystal structures to get this. And non-symorphic crystal structures is that you, you combine uh, uh, lattice movement together with the point symmetry. So for example, here you have a rotation axis, but then it mirrors the hand on the other side, but you move along uh, half of the lattice distance here along C direction. This is so-called non-symorphic group. And why do I think these new fermions are interesting? So now it comes back that I look on the materials which were predicted in this paper from the viewpoint of chemistry. And if you see these new fermions are new fermions because they have this high degeneration point, but it's much more. All the more or less all the crystals, most of the crystals have a chiral crystal structure. And I think there will be a paper of Hassan coming out soon about chiral topology. And most of the crystals are superconductors if they're not magnetic, okay? So the question is here also again, uh, if they're not magnetic, is there a relation between this highly degeneration of the, uh, of the band structure and maybe that they are superconductors? And one famous class of superconductors it are the A15 superconductors, which are still the superconductors mostly in application. And I think this is always luck if you have an 80 years old co-worker because he was working at the time of niobium antimony and he said at this time already the people thought maybe superconductivity in these compounds were related to the highly degenerated band structures, which then I have to say, at the superconducting transition, slightly distorted, there's a martensitic phase transition. Anyway, to think whether the new fermions are related to the crystals, chiral crystal structure and superconductivity is something which smart theoretician could think about the future. As in a similar way that I say all the semi-metals are heavy element compound, there are no semi-metals beyond graphene which have uh, light elements. Anyway, so. And then the other group of materials are, so now we are coming really to this uh, crossing points. So sometimes uh, we looked the whole time now for lifting the degeneration having topological insulators, but nowadays people think even from the physics is much more richer if I stay with the crossing point. And uh, so I go to white semi-metals and to Dirac semi-metals. So and uh, how can I achieve this? So simply, if I look for the three-dimensional band structure, I have the overlap between the conduction and the valence band. If I uh, have a forbidden crossing here around this line, I end up with the topological insulator, which is insulating hopefully in the, band, uh, in the gap and has this very nice surface state, which we already saw. But what could happen is that it not opens up everywhere, so I end up I end up with crossing points or lines even, but crossing points at certain points, and this even leads to more interesting physics experimentally. So we have this Dirac points or Y points here at the non, uh, where I don't have the lifting up of the degeneration. And Dirac and Y points are related by symmetry. So Dirac points occur at high symmetry points. In the Bryan zone, if I draw my band structure, it's easy to find the Dirac points. If I draw my band structure, it's impossible to find Y points right? because Dirac points are fourfold degenerated and they split, if they split up in Y points, if I have a crystal structure with a lower symmetry, or if I have magnetic material, this can be splitting up, or if I apply magnetic field into Y points, they are much more difficult to find because they are somewhere hidden in the Bryan zone. So therefore, this is, I think there are many, many more compounds which have Y points uh, than we know because uh, they are hidden, okay? And if I have these Y points in the bike, they have chirality, and now we are back to my DNA, left hand, right hand molecules. 
So I, prom I tell you, I want to do catalysis with this uh, semi-metals. So they have chirality, so they lead Fermi, so at the surface we don't have a Dirac cone like a surface state, we have this Fermi arcs which are connected on both sides of my crystals. So as I said, so the Dirac cone is four or uh, times degenerated like in graphene. If I strain graphene, which I cannot do easily, so because I destroy the aromaticity, so I would get Y points, or if I apply magnetic field, I always turn a Dirac point into Y points, and then I get this very interesting uh, Fermi arcs, uh, which are chiral. So um, here we come back. So then sometimes life helps or is more complicated, another question to the theory, which I simply say intuitively, um, is like graphene is a very special case because here is a band structure of graphene which I showed you before. And here we have the degeneration of the points. We have a Dirac cone. And the, you, if you see the band dispersion, it's like 30 EV and minus 20 EV, it's a 50 EV band inversion. And this is the case because the carbon has a very strong covalent bond. And so therefore we have this giant band dispersion which we don't find in so many compounds. You can go, or get, uh, you don't find this nice kind of nice bands. And there's nothing else than this P-band around the Fermi energy. So, and this is a very nice type one vibe, uh, uh, a direct point where the, it's really pointy at the Fermi energy if the Fermi energy is just there. So this is band structure. But life is always more gray and not simply white and black. And in many of the compounds, the real solids, we are investigating the, uh, the, the cone is not nicely uh, sit, standing up and the point is not really a point. So it's much more complex. The cone is tilted. So very often I get uh, the points above the Fermi energy, below the Fermi energy or electron and hole if the cone tilts. I automatically get electron and hole pockets. And my feeling is this is also even not so bad because it helps us to stabilize this uh, nice linear dispersion. And the linear dispersion brings really the interesting properties like this giant mobilities, the giant magnetoresistance effect, etc. You know, so that which I think will have maybe very interesting properties in the future. So this was the semi-metal. I come back to the semi-metal at the end, but there are also metals. And uh, so if you are in material science or chemistry, you always learn gold has a very beautiful color. And the origin of the nice color of the gold is because the six S electrons, which I told you before, comes much closer to the core. So they are, sorry, they are, they are if you compare it to silver, so therefore, the transition from 4D to 5S in silver here to 5D to 6S because the contraction of the S electrons is much smaller. So this leads to this very nice uh, color. So it's a relativistic effect. So then at the same time, if you read old papers about Shockley uh, and the surface state of Shockley, and so because we were interested, as I told you, we are interested in using really making big money out of topology by using it for catalysis. We thought, let's go back to, uh, to the surface state which we have in platinum in gold, and especially because also platinum has the highest berry curvature for any non-magnetic material. So it already shows that we have crossing points in platinum, some interesting electronic structure in platinum. So, and then we went back to the papers of Shockley who said, okay, who invented surface states by uh, looking for surface states in a periodic po potential. And now more theoretician I know also are working on this. And he wrote in his abstract, if you have two bands, with different parity, you get a surface state, which is more or less the definition of a topological insulator. You know, different parities, we said S and P, for example. So if they cross, we can have this topological surface state. So, and this is exactly the case also in gold. So in gold and uh, platinum, we have the same situation as in a topological insulator. Here we have a crossing between the P at the S band because of here, the contraction of the S-band, 
and the p-band in the band structure, and we would get exactly this expected. If gold would be a semiconductor or an insulator, we would get exactly a nice Dirac cone like in bismuth selenide. But life is a little bit more difficult. The Fermi energy of gold, so you have to, mercury is, by the way, then better. You have to dope gold if, if you want to go exactly there. And the other thing is the surface state of gold are slightly banded, and therefore we normally have seen only this part of the electronic structure and thought about this part, and nobody thought about topological and band inversion in the context of gold and platinum. But uh, because in the past people thought about the surface state like a Shockley state like this, but the reality is like this. You have a rush bar splitting, okay, then you can think it's a rush bar splitting, but indeed you see this, and this is what we then calculated here in gold, so you nicely see the S-band coming below the Fermi energy and the P-band above the Fermi energy, and you see gold is quite gapped in the band structure, and indeed it has this band inversion which leads then to the surface state of gold which really connects conduction band with valence band, and we had a nasty referee, and he wanted to see it experimentally, thinking you cannot measure unoccupied states, but these are two photon electron spectroscopy which really shows this. Uh, and now uh, I know um, Richard Martin writing a big several hundred pages uh, 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 explanation that this is indeed the case that the Chakri states are always topological surface states. Okay. So uh, for a few minutes, I simply show you how to measure the properties. So we make many of very nice single crystals from uh, all these materials, but also sometimes it's nice to have uh, thin films. Uh, but here it's very easy. We have these crystals, and uh, they are useful because now even some people in high energy physics and in uh, astrophysics, they ask us maybe can we collaborate theoretician in astrophysics, okay, because this could be maybe tabletop experiment uh, because quantum field theory is a common thread for uh, uh, high energy physics and uh, astrophysics. Anyway, this is our motivation really to push it. And the way we do this, so somebody predicts by theory something interesting. We go to Kantmart or we, just, we know, uh, we work with Andre very well. So we have the predicted material, we grow the single crystals. So then we do ARPAS to verify the properties or STM, okay, and then because very often you are more interested if you combine topology with superconductivity, and at the end we want to make really, if you want to say quantum anomalous soil effect at room temperature or something like this, okay. So it would be good if you predict more magnetic uh, white semi metals with room temperature CT, okay, please. This is one to do on your list. So what we do, we measure more or less, most of the time, not quantum effect, we do a simple Hall measurement. We take a single crystal and measure transport in a magnetic field. So they all have their quantum counterpart, which the measurements are similar, but you know, in the field, quantum, measuring the quantum counterpart is for us the next step on the, which we most of the time don't do by ourselves, so because we simply identify the interesting materials here. So, and we can, despite of the Hall effect, we are now very much interested in the anomalous Hall effect. We measure, this is the case in the Hall effect, we apply magnetic field and we measure transport. In the anomalous Hall effect, we have a magnetic material and measure an additional contribution to the Hall effect, which is the anomalous Hall effect. And this is really a good measure possibility for us to measure the Berry curvature, I don't know. Who knows about the Berry curvature? Okay, most of you know, okay? So therefore, for us it's a lot of fun now if we measure high anomalous Hall effect, we know already we have crossing points at the Fermi energy, we have interesting magnetic structures, okay? So, and I think if we, from our conclusion is if we, if we measure, uh, so if we want to have quantum Hall effect, uh, without a magnetic field, the quantum spin Hall effect, we need topological materials. This is quantum Hall effect. This shows this very nice edge current with different spin direction. But in quantum Hall effect, which was invented from Klitzing, from Klitzing, so you need a magnetic field, a high magnetic field. So in quantum spin Hall effect, you don't need it. And people know, maybe if they know talks from Klitzing, he always says he now can uh, have the 
NIST and the PTB in Germany to make the kilogram more correct and uh, everything. So, so they, they did this with uh, his uh, measurement, but they are already doing this also with the quantum spin hall effect to, together with Lawrence Mohenkamp. So if people are still debating about the quantum spin hall effect, it seems to go in even a first application. So because here you do the same with automagnetic field, and if you want to make devices which do more than only the quantum spin hall effect, a magnetic field is always bad. Nobody likes magnetic fields in the lab, okay? So having no magnetic field is already nice, and if you have a magnetic material which has the same properties as a quantum spin hall effect, you can have the quantum anomalous hall effect which gives you a poor spin current, and this magnetic field is now the intrinsic magnetization, so it's no external magnetic field. Okay, so and our goal is to do this at room temperature. This at room temperature is graphene, so finding magnetic materials uh, which have a large quantum anomalous Hall effect at room temperature. So and then you can also, despite of a voltage, you can always apply a, a thermal gradient, which gives you then the Nernst or here the, uh, the Seebeck or the Nernst effect. And I think because we find really giant anomalous Hall effect, we also find giant anomalous Nernst effect based on the barrier curvature. Maybe we can have some impact even for energy conversion because this is, allows us to violate the wiedemann franz law and make maybe really much more efficient energy uh, conversion system. So we have a patent with Ohio State with Saruman on this. So far at low temperature, but we are working on higher temperature. And you see, it's very simple. You know, we take our single crystal. Here's our tiny single crystal. Then we make contact on a puck, which, we, which simply fits into a PPMS. And then we have uh, voltage. It's a little bit more complicated if we apply a gradient in uh, uh, not uh, the voltage, if you apply a terminal gradient. But it's the same. And we put it in the PPMS, we press a button and we measure. So now you can imagine that Andre Bernowick as a theoretician, everybody knows Andre. So he wants to come up with a lab. He wants to grow his own single crystals and he wants to do PPMS measurement since he has so, so, uh, seen in our lab that it's not so difficult. <laughs> okay, now the theoretician come and compete with us. Huh? What is left for us? Huh? Okay, good. So I show you uh, the example of the vials so measuring the whites, and this is really, um, as I said, this was the first prediction where really also experimentally one succeeded. It's a very simple binary compound, niobium phosphide, niobium arsenic, tantalum phosphide, tantalum arsenic. The band structure looks like this, so you have additional electron and hole pockets. And uh, the crystals are easy to make. I have a movie, but I maybe show it at the end if I find it. You know, you do take a polycrystalline sample, you take some iodide, and then you grow very nice single crystals here. And as I said, it's very difficult very often to find the Y points because they are hidden somewhere in the Bryan zone. So this is the Y point, they are somewhere inside. And most of the time, we like to only show the nice high symmetry point, so then very often we miss it. Okay, so you need some intuition. And here, as I said, you have additional electron and hole pockets. Anyway, so um, this are your prediction. I assume some of the people did some predictions. And so, so, so for Y point, there were already a lot of nice, interesting physical prediction. So because if for a very special situation, if you apply a magnetic field in the direction of the current, I told you, so we measure always the current, but in Hall measurement, we apply magnetic field, and we can apply the magnetic field in all kinds of directions. But for the special case, if current and field is perpendicular, so you can do this chiral anomaly in wild semi-metals. This is the first Landau level, so if you transport electron density from one, arc, uh, from one uh, level here from this direction in Z, Z, so you make a chiral anomaly because then it's not the same number here on each side, and this leads to many interesting properties like the anomalous Hall effect, an intrinsic anomalous Hall effect in non-magnetic materials, or the planar Hall effect, the chiral anomaly, and the axial gravitational anomaly, which means for us we measure if we have the B field and the current in the same direction, a negative magnetoresistance, and otherwise the B square behavior. So simple, simple equation what, 
what are the results of all these predictions. Why is this so interesting? And I think I'm not sure whether all the theoreticians know why. It's so super interesting, you know? So, but since I'm not a, a deeply thinking theoretical physicist, you know, I rely on Wikipedia. So I went to Wikipedia and tried to understand what is really the interesting thing about the chiral anomaly. Okay, so, and I'm really inter uh, amazed because it, this is a way to explain the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. So, so you have an analogy between the Weyl or Dirac semi-metals uh, and the vacuum state uh, of particles and antiparticles, and uh, both are related to the uh, chiral anomaly, which is a way maybe to break fundamental laws of physics uh, via relativistic quantum uh, field theory. So I think this is really worth to think even much more deep about this, you know? So because I think Max Planck has an institute in Heidelberg where people weight positrons versus electrons and they hope they find a difference in weight. So when I started to discuss with them, with them about my ideas about catalysis, they want to now weight left-hand molecules versus right-hand molecules. But I, I don't believe that you find something in the weight. I think if we really can uh, show that we really can measure the chiral anomaly in some sense directly, I think it's also a little bit more evident that this is the origin of the uh, meta-antimeter asymmetry. So I think it's worth to think about more uh, experiments in this direction. So the first prediction was uh, that these white semi-metals have fermions. And this is not so difficult because you do angle resolve photo emission and you do again your surface state calculation. So bin high did the surface state calculation. And niobium phosphide is lighter than tantalum phosphide and tantalum arsenide. And you see nicely how the, the, the distance between the wild points depends on the uh, uh, spin orbit coupling. And you see that if you measure the Fermi axis it's really nicely in a very nice agreement with the experimental data. So we know already there is interesting physics to find. Anyway, so um, here is only the results because I'm running out otherwise of time. So we did niobium phosphide in bike. It doesn't show the chiral anomaly, but if we make this very nice nano ribbons, we uh, just stop the Fermi energy to the right point accidentally. Sometimes accidentally is good. So, and the good thing is, so then we measure the magnetoresistance, which means the resistance in a magnetic field. And as I said, the prediction was there should be a positive magnetoresistance if the B field is not perpendicular and a negative if the B field is perpendicular and we should fulfill this B square behavior. And this is indeed what you see. If the magnetic field is perpendicular to the current, you see a positive magnetoresistance effect. And this wickets here, uh, quantum oscillation, so it's very nice. We exactly can conclude where the Fermi energy is in our material because all the same metal shows this nice quantum oscillation. And if we uh, move the magnetic field perpendicular to the current, we show a nice, we see a nice uh, negative magnetoresistance effect even up to room temperature. So, but then we wanted to look on the uh, mixed gravitational anomaly, which was predicted by Subir Sachev and some astrophysicists, and their prediction was you have to apply, uh, instead of a voltage, you apply a thermal gradient, and the prediction was here that then if you measure uh, the thermal conductance, so it should be going at low fields with a uh, square to the uh, magnetic field, and high, at high field it should diminish, and this is an experiment, so here it's a voltage, and the B field, it shows nicely this uh, B square behavior, uh, at least at a certain area. And then you see here, if you see the, you do the same experiment with the uh, terminal gradient, you see exactly what was predicted, the B square behavior, and then it turns around and tries to diminish. So this shows how nicely you can even uh, work on questions which were ask in the context of uh, astrophysics, if we get our astrophysics uh, and uh, find interesting 
physics. Anyway, so we had a difficult uh, referee because the Subir Sachev theory was based on a hydrodynamic theory, and the referee said we have to remove the hydrodynamic because it's bullshit. Okay, you can read the discussion in Blocks of Nature and the fights of certain people there. Okay, yes. So. Anyway, <coughs> we still believe that this hydrodynamic flow maybe plays an important role in this compound which was topology because in uh, 2016 there were three papers published at the same time, two on graphene and one on palladium cobalt O2 from uh, Dresden, Philip Moll and Andre, uh, uh, Andy McKenzie. They claim that they have found materials where the electrons don't flow like a Jude gas, they flow much more correlated like a viscose liquid. And there were different experiments how they did this because this is like uh, electron gets scattered on the nucleus. This is a symbol here for the nucleus or electron simply flows through the crystal. So one was a thermal transport. So it shows uh, the, with the violation of the wiedemann franz law, it shows that the uh, phonons are decoupled in some sense from the electron scattering. The other was that there's a size dependent, like if you do viscous experiments in the first semester of physics, if you still have to do experimental physics, you know, during this. So if you have different sides of uh, pipes and you try to put a viscous liquid in there, it doesn't work if you have very thin pipes, okay? So this is an experiment which you can do with crystals. And uh, I think then uh, this was the work done here. And, uh, we took another white semi-metal tungsten phosphide to do the experiment because it was a, a protected Y because the Y points with the same chirality was close to each other and with different chirality far from each other, so the annihilation is not a problem. And this compound had a, a very large RRR value, so the resistance at room temperature and lower temperatures uh, strongly different. It's even the resistance at low temperature is extremely uh, small, even better than clean copper. So more or less accidentally, even by thermal transport, we made a very clean single crystal, which has a mean free pass, which is larger than the crystal size. Okay. So we use this material for the experiment. So we have half a millimeter mean free pass in this material to look whether we can see some evidence for hydrodynamic flow, and we use this crystal to do all the experiments. And at the end, we had more open questions than solution, as usual. So um, the first experiment, we did the pipe experiment, the size-dependent experiment of the viscous flow uh, of the electron. So we made crystals of different size. Uh, and we really see that the resistance change strongly, so it goes up and it can become even very resistant. And this is not only tungsten phosphide. If you see the experiments in literature, it's there for cadmium arsenic, for the Dirac semi-metals, and for other, also, even if the people don't investigate it, have investigated this under this time. And there was a prediction that if it's a viscous flow, it should go with the width to the square, and if it's a, uh, uh, if it's uh, Jude gas, it should have no width dependent. And here you see as a function of temperature, the width dependent, and you see here there's no width dependent, and at the end at low temperature there's a width dependent of the square, which shows really evidence for hydrodynamic flow in these materials. The second proof was uh, look for the uh, violation of the wiedemann franz law there. You have to compare thermal transport with uh, electrical transport, and normally it always has a Lorentz number, so the thermal transport over the uh, normal conductivity always leads to the Lorentz number. There's always a small dis uh, violation intrinsically at low temperature, but here in this materials, in the semi-metal, you see that there's a fully breakdown of the wiedemann franz law, and uh, uh, Cameron Benian has measured it too, and he sees also recovery uh, of the wiedemann franz law at very low temperature. So um, you can even then calculate the viscosity for these electrons, which is like liquid nitrogen. And uh, then the second, the third question, which was not investigated up to now, was simply when I saw this behavior, 
that depending from the size, you know, here's your conductivity, uh, resistivity as a function of temperature, and with smaller size, it, the resistance become much larger. This is like what you observe also in a magnetic field. And if you see in nine Tesla, here's the upper curve, you see this curve, if you would not know that this is nine Tesla, looks like a topological insulator. And this is a typical curve for every Dirac and white semi-metal, okay? So if you apply magnetic field, it looks like a topological insulator, so it has a plateau here at the end. And uh, so, so comparing the magnetic field dependence and the size dependence so, uh, brought us to the idea to look for magnetohydrodynamic, which people have very nice equation for plasma physics. And um, indeed, the data which you get from white semi-metals totally fit to the equation which were developed for flat plasma uh, physics. So this is uh, uh, rho to multiplied by the width square, and uh, this is a f uh, theory is gray, and this are the data of uh, the of the wires or of the single crystals. Then Johannes is the uh, uh, interested in astrophysics, so therefore, and uh, also in um, terminal transport, so he really got all the, um, all the uh, relaxation times out of all these data we had, the momentum relaxation time and the thermal energy relaxation time, uh, which shows then really that the, at uh, high temperatures, the momentum relaxation time, it's really, but I'm done now, so it's only nice. So um, it's lying, so this is a line, which is a Planckian bound of dissipation, and amazingly, the momentum relaxation time lies at high temperatures on the Planckian bound of uh, relaxation, and the uh, energy relaxation, terminal energy relaxation time at low temperature. and. Uh, I only can tell you, Jan Zanen, he scrapped his head and he said, this cannot be, don't ask me why. Maybe some of the older theoreticians can ask this question. But it simply tells us uh, there's a lot of interesting physics which can be still discovered in this field of topology. And with this, I want to finish. And I hope I gave you a little bit an insight how to find new materials and that there's a lot to do and uh, maybe as an outlook, I can tell you, we are now interested in magnetism on topology. And since in magnetism, we nearly have even more wild semi-metals than in non-magnetic material. So I think we are not running out of business for the next five years. Okay, with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to ask questions.